Hello everyone. In this video I'm going to present entire photogrammetry based process of how I capture sand surface and how I turn it into fully functional PBR environment material. So in details I'm going to present surface capture with the equipment I usually use, image photo editing in Photolab 2, photogrammetry reconstruction in Metashape, building low poly model for baking in ZBrush, texture baking using Substance Designer Baker, aerial tweaks and scene removal using Art Engine Artomatics, albedo and roughness tweaks in Substance Designer, and at the end I'm going to present the final material in Marmoset Toolbag. Hope you will find this video useful and let's start! The first step is to find a place where I can find the surface I want to capture. To find a nice sand spot I decided to go to the beach. And the weather was pretty nice for a walk, but definitely not the best for the photogrammetry. Because it was cold, the beach was almost empty with just really a few people walking around. And it was quite easy to find an area without human footsteps. Unfortunately this area was in open space and the main issue I had to solve was the sun casting direct, direct shadows. Direct shadows when captured are very hard to remove from albedo texture and avoiding them is the top priority for the surface scanning. It was the reason I bring the light reflector with myself. Unfortunately as you will see later the wind made it pretty hard to hold and use. When I picked the place, I set up my gear to start the capture. The first piece of equipment I started with was the tripod. I use aluminium Manfrotto 190 Go tripod as its top section can be rotated 90 degree and let the camera to face perpendicularly to the ground surface. While setting it, I had to be very careful to do not affect and to do not destroy the surface I was going to capture. The next thing I picked from my backpack was the color checker, and so far I put it to my back pocket to get hands free and mount the camera on the tripod. With the camera mounted, I took and unfolded the plastic ruler. I use it every time I can as it works great as a scale reference later, but also helps me to define the initial line where the capture starts. Since I want to capture exactly 180 cm by 180 cm area, I unfolded the ruler to 180 cm only and mark its end by turning last 20 cm of it into 90 degree angle. It is being useful in cases when somehow ruler's graduation is not visible after the reconstruction, and usually it happens as I don't waste too many images to cover ruler details, and I remove it later anyway. So the next step is to set up the camera and set up the white balance and to make it I captured white balance page from the color checker and set the camera to use it while setting the custom white balance and here is the picture with the white balance page I took next I have checked if all camera settings are correct I set the ISO to 100 the focal length to 35 millimeters, as this is the one which works the best for me and gives me the best surface quality with reasonable amount of images. And I also set the f-stop to 8 as I usually do. And with the setup complete I switch the color checker into color calibration page and captured it as a color reference for future tweaks if I need any.
and here is the image preview with the color checker included. Since, as I mentioned before, the light conditions were not consistent, I decided to use the light reflector. It's a very useful tool in this type of scenarios as makes captures less dependent on weather conditions, but it's not very handy to use while shooting at the same time. Also, it needs some additional training with unfolding and folding it back. I believe I made a mistake by facing the golden side of it towards the surface I was trying to capture, but since the sun was behind me and wasn't very strong, fortunately, I avoided strong light bounces and surface was unaffected very much. So in a future probably depending on power of light I'm going to use probably white side. Anyway I realized I made this mistake in the middle of the capture. So, just to make sure I have necessary tool to calibrate the color in case it is needed, at the end of this capture I recapture the color checker again. So, since the color capture took me 15 minutes, let's speed this video up a bit. And while moving faster, it is also easier to notice how lighting condition were changing. Finally, I managed to capture 137 images for construction and thanks to the tripod and light reflector, as you will see later, 100% of them were sharp, consistent and useful for photogrammetry construction. So, in this moment the capture was over. Just as I mentioned before, I recapture the color checker to make sure I have necessary data for calibration if needed. When the capture is over, it's time to bring all the captured images to the computer and process them with photo editing software. In my case, I use Photolab 2. It's important to be careful and don't go too far with pre production tweaks as photogrammetry software usually does its own corrections. What I usually do is setting the white balance for all images. I do it by using the middle clip from color checker. This is this one. And adjust all the images to be on similar level of lighting. I do this step even if I set white balance during capture already. 
it just helps me to be sure that color is accurate across entire capture. This step is very important since this is the last time we work on high dense pure row information and changes we do here are usually quality lossless. On this stage, all operations we process usually happens on 14 or 16 bits and it depends on route format type and usually route details differs between camera types and brands. In my case, because I use Canon 80D, it's 14 bits. The plan is to tweak all the captured images while working on dense raw data and when it's done turn them all into 8-bit low dynamic range image especially any photogrammetry software would trim them to 8 bits anyway when this step is over entire data is being converted into 8 bits and any other rgb tweaks and changes processed on those images are going to cast as the quality so it's important to know that this is the last step when we can play with the color data without losing any information. Usually 14 bits raw image covers additional two steps of dynamic range. So it means that when we increase or decrease luminance value, it is still being covered by real data and we are not erasing any edge RGB values, replacing them with pure black at the bottom or pure whites at the top. Also, in 14 bits we work on very dense RGB data, so any shifts also has enough information to be based on something without being interpolated. Of course, we, we need to be careful what we do and how far we go with the, any changes. Our target is to deliver the best source data for photogrammetry reconstruction we can. So, as long as we fix this data by fixing color glitches, tweaking color shifting, and by bringing luminance consistency between images, we are doing well. So, basically, at pre-processing stage, I remove color glitches, set white balance to make sure captured color data is physically correct and not affected by surrounding light, and I set consistent luminance level between images to avoid getting different color patches across the reconstructor's surface later. Bringing luminance consistency across all captured images is important since usually each capture takes some time and very often lighting conditions are changing. Some images are brighter because sun came out, some darker because it was hidden behind a denser cloud. And to deal with that in Lightroom, for example, I used Autotone option. But since in this case I'm using Photolab, I use Smart Lighting. Power of this option should be set to minimum, as minimum as we need. And as long as there is no much luminance difference between images, I use quite low setting. So what I usually do in here, I select all the images with, by pressing Ctrl A. And I started from the one with color checker, color checker included. Let's set the intensity to 25. And let's see how image consistency looks like. Some are still a bit darker, but I think they're pretty similar. The next option I use is Lens Shop. It is based on laboratory tests made for certain types of lenses. So since my camera and lens setup is recognized by Photolab, I use this The same thing is with the chromatic aberration. Since my lens is recognized by Photolab, it means that it was tested by their laboratories. And since software knows real level of chromatic aberration delivered by this exact lens, turning this option on removes aberration related artifacts from each image. The next thing I use is vignetting correction. It simply removes dark gradient around the lens edges. 
I just leave that option on. I don't need exposure compensation, so let's turn it off. And the most important is white balance. So I'm selecting that color button and selecting that clip in here. And since all the images are selected, it processed that operation on all of them. When done, it's time to export all those images into 8-bit files. I usually start as JPG without any compression and it should be enough. One more thing, because I know that albedo has to be a bit higher, I will just tweak the exposure compensation manually. slightly to make sure I'm not losing anything. Okay, and le let's export everything. all those images baked into 8 bits, the next step is to use them for 3D reconstruction and it can be done using any photogrammetry software, I prefer Metashape. To do that I opened the software, I need to bring all those images into here, so let's select add photos from workflow and Let's take only those images I want to use for reconstruction. And you can see they're being loaded right now. I have included that folded ruler intentionally because it helps a lot while building low poly model. And it's a great reference for scaling. We can estimate image quality if we want to. We, it can be done if we go to the details in here. And we press right mouse button. And we can select estimate image quality for everything. The image quality for reconstruction should be over 0 0.5 so everything below 0 0.5 is a bad quality everything above is okay and the higher the better the perfect quality is one and as we can see it's usually 0 08 almost 0 09 so yeah those images are very very well made and should be okay for entire reconstruction Let's wait until the processing is done. It's ready. So let's go lower and you can see everything is pretty consistent. We've got even 0, 09. Yeah, everything is consistent and this is the basic thing to get all images consistent to each other. The next step we need to go is to align photos. So to do that we select this option from the workflow menu and we have to select quality. The highest quality takes more time, the lowest is pretty fast, but it affects the accuracy. Sometimes when we set the highest quality 
and we can see that not all images has been used it's rare to try medium or something like this and reprocess image alignment let's set the highest one and press ok again it takes some time to have it done what the software is trying to do right now is it's trying to find overlapping images and trying to put them together and estimate their position in 3D space. Because next steps are much more time consuming when compared to the image alignment, let's process them all together using batch process feature. To do this, we have to go to workflow and instead of taking next step of reconstruction, we have to pick this one, it's a batch process, and it opens the new window. And in this window, we can add all additional steps of reconstruction we want to proceed with. So let's pick add, and the next thing we have to do is build dense clouds. So let's pick this one. Let's leave quality as ultra high. Okay, let's add another step, which is build mesh. As a source data, we are going to use generated dense cloud. And for reconstruction, we have two options, arbitrary mode. That one works for 3D reconstruction and height field, which is much faster. And we are going to pick this one. The difference is that the height field mode process data in two dimensions. The arbitrary one process in three dim dimensions and can take even 100 times longer. So let's face count, let's use custom because FBX file can handle vertex colors just for 67 million polygons. So everything which is above is going to be black. So 67 millions right now is a limit we can use. With the custom face count, I set 67 manually. And we have to calculate vertex colors too. So these are important things we have to do. Let's press OK. And let's add another one. It's export model. We are picking export model and we have to set the path mesh format which is going to be FBX and we don't need any textures. So let's select the name of our file. It's going to be 2 to 3 send HP for high poly, save it, and as mesh format, Autodesk FBX. We don't need any textures, we need vertex colors. Doesn't matter if we have cameras, because we are not going to use them. Yeah, I think that's all, and let's take this option it saves project every after each step is processed and finished and we can press ok button and come back a few hours later and here is the result as you can see all three steps are ok zero fails let's close that window so based on 137 images, Metashape were able to reconstruct 66.7 million dense volume mesh. The best way to preview level of reconstructed detail is to preview the dense cloud because this is pretty efficient way and it works in real time. So this is dense cloud.
Let's zoom it in. So we've got this level of details. And uh, this dense cloud was a base to reconstruct final high poly mesh. Previewing mesh itself is a bit harder since Metashape struggles to operate on a dense geometry in real time. But let's try it. We have to wait a second. And here it is. This is mesh. I'm trying to zoom it in, but it lacks of response. So this is our high poly mesh. Let's go back to dense cloud preview. Yep. Because even Zebra struggles to operate on as dense geometry, I'm going to create a light a bit lighter version of this mesh. I'm going to use meta shape um, decimation tool which can be found in here. It's called the Summate Mesh. And I simply set the decimation target as three and a half million polygons. And I just run the tool. This process is pretty fast since this is exactly the same mesh, but just decimated into lower mesh density and because it is located in exactly the same 3D space as already exported high poly model. It should help us to position low poly in the correct place. And I believe that three and a half million polygons is still enough to see all surface details needed for low poly positioning. And so far I never needed that low poly geometry to be denser. Okay, so here we have three and a half million dense poly model. This is still dense clouds preview. Let's see mesh itself. Yeah, you can see it has lower quality, <coughs> but I think it's definitely enough data to work with. And when it is done, I just export the model as additional FBX file. But in this process, I won't save the Metashape scene because if anything goes wrong in the future, it will help me to go back. So let's export the model. Let's call it 3 million for low poly. And it's done. I've forgotten to mention about console. In this console, we can check all the reconstruction details which happen during the reconstruction. And we can open it from view and console in here. So everything what happens in Meta shape can be previewed in here. You can see at 1 am I loaded all the photos. Let's move forward. I think it was the time when the pack process has started. And You can see the process was over at 5.30 p.m. So it took about um, four and a half hours to get mesh reconstructed into 67 million polygon dense model. Okay, so let's close the console. 
and I think we can leave the meta shape and go to the low poly, create low poly model. In this step, I'm going to use ZBrush to create low poly model for baking. Let's fill entire space. Okay. And to do this, we need to load the FBX file. We exported the three and a half million poly version. We have exported from the meta shape. So let's find it first. This is this one. So let's import this one. It takes a few seconds to be loaded. And it should be here. Yep, we've got file imported. Let's go into edit mode. We've got some visual debris on the screen. So to remove them, I just press Ctrl N and the uh, screen has just the mesh, which is important for us. I press F to zoom and focus on it. To work more efficiently, I prefer to change the perspective. It helps me to preview this mesh better. And I also change the shader type. It can be any type we want to, but I prefer basic material. And here we go. So this is our three and a half dance million high poly model. And what we have to do, we have to create low poly plane and align it along this high poly model for baking. So to do this, I'm just going to subtool and I append plane 3D. And here it is. Right now we have to select that plane in the subtool palette. Go to move and we've got gizmo we can use to manipulate its position. There's a small trick to increase manipulation accuracy. It's to select the way we are going to manipulate. Move your mouse button away from the mesh itself. And as you can see, when I'm moving mouse cursor, it's much more accurate. Right now I'm trying to set the scale because I want to recreate exactly 180 centimeters by 180 centimeters area, I have to use that captured ruler and align this plane and set the scale of this plane to match that ruler. So from here, I'll try to zoom it. So from this point to the end, it's 180 centimeters of real space. So let's align this plane. Yeah, I think I've got it. The better plane is aligned the less problems we've got with height map, so it's worth to spend time on this stage. Okay, I think we've got it. Having that ruler included in here doesn't matter, really, because we are going to erase it later during seam removal. What we have to do is to UV map this plane. So to do this, I'm just using UV Master is in Z plugins. 
and I simply press unwrap and it's done. When it's done we have to export this file as another FBX. Mm, let's call it free two to three cent LP for low poly. And the file is exported. Let's save this scene in case we need it in the future. Done. And this step is over. Now we are moving to texture baking. It means that in the next step I need to use low poly model I have just built to bake all the PBR data from high poly one. It was the 67 million polydense one generated by Metashape. I have tested many bakers and I prefer the Substance Designer Baker so far because it's quite easy to use and accurate enough and it's pretty fast compared to the competition. So before I start baking, I simply need to create new substance. It can be any, doesn't matter. And I need to run the baker. To do this, I need to bring um, the baking target. This is the low poly plane. So this is that one. Let's bring it in here. We've got it. And by pressing right mouse button on it, I can run baker by selecting bake model information. And this is the baker window. And in this window, I have to select the source file to bake from. This is our high poly model. So from files. This is 2 to 3 cent HP as high poly. Let's bring it into the baker. It is. And in here, we need to set the output folder. Let's call it bake. And the name, let's call it bake2. It doesn't matter for us on this stage. And we need to set the texture size. Let's set it as 4K. Mm, default format, let's use PNG because it handles 16 bits. It's very important to have 16 bits for height map and normal map. It doesn't matter for color, for example, because it was trimmed to 8 bits anyway already. And let's set anti-aliasing to 4x4. I have found this one, the most efficient one. It's good enough, but it doesn't take super long time to have processed. Let's create Baker's render list. So simply we are adding what PBR textures we want to be baked. And we should take everything from mesh. So we need ambient occlusion map from mesh. And I usually bake bent normal map, but we are not going to use it in this tutorial, but let's take it. And of course we need color map from mesh. This is the our, our albedo. We need definitely height map from mesh. And the last one is the normal map from mesh. And we've got them all. Let's change anti-aliasing for albedo because it hasn't been changed automatically. And what's left to be set is the max and mean frontal distance and back distance. So how it works. Those values are used to build kind of virtual cage. So it tells us how far Baker is going to bake from. So it works in person. So 0.1 means everything above the surface in 10% of low poly scale will be taken to be baked from. And real value means the same thing, but 
on back of the surface. I think 10% is enough, but 20 should be also fine. Okay, so I think the baker is set and what's left is to run it, I think. Yeah, I think I didn't miss anything. Let's start the process. It takes some time. So it has to load the high poly mesh, which is pretty heavy. Let's see how heavy it is. It has over one gigabyte of data. So you can see it's being loaded. And as soon as it's loaded, the baker will start baking. And this is the preview window in here. We can see how it bakes things. I think for the purpose of this video, it's worth to increase the video speed because I assume it it's gonna take a couple of minutes. And everything is baked and the baking process is over. We can preview baked maps in here. So this is ambient occlusion one. Color map. You can see we've got color filled with spaces which were missing. So now we can close the baker and substance and move to the next step when we need to bring all those textures together and fix all glitches we find and finally tile them. So here we are in Artomatics and we are going to do some fixing, tweaking and remove seams in here. So there are different ways to fix visual glitches and tile baked material and usually I do it manually in Painter but I have covered it already in previous tutorials so this time I'm going to use Art Engine Artomatics and its artificial intelligence. So seam removal in Artomatics is very easy and very fast and so far it's the most efficient way to do this for generic materials like soil, sand, pebbles or something like this. What I really need to do is to load all materials and bring them together into one material, use mask node and mark areas I don't like and really let the artificial intelligence replace them with different variations of what's left and tile everything at the end. So this is Artomatics interface and as you can see to the left we've got library window where we have to bring our textures let's do this so we need ambient occlusion we don't need a band normal so let's grab color map height map and normal let's bring them in here this is the 2d window to preview any texture. This is the 3D preview window. This is window with options. The window in here is a grab window and in here it's a node window. So we should we usually do the work in node window. So let's grab our textures into node window. And from here we can preview them in 2D window or 3D by pressing right mouse button and selecting view into the view viewport. Yeah, we've got this material previewed in here or let's view it in 3D viewport. Yeah, you can see, we can see it in here. Of course, it's still broken. In here, we've got additional options to make that preview more useful for us. So what I usually do is 
I change the HDR map. Yeah, I prefer this one. In here we can change tiling because we want our material to be tiled. Let's set it to two. So you can see how material repeats. And in here we've got all additional options for PBR preview like height preview, deslation. Let's increase it slightly a bit and increase the slation. But on this stage it doesn't matter really. Let's build material first. So we've got diffuse, ambient occlusion, height map and normal map. With the space, we bring nodes many, and we can simply type node name, and it should appear for us, and we will be able to add it to the graph window. Or we can select one from existing. So what we need is to compose materials. So let's type compose material. Yep, this one. And you can see it has inputs and material as output. So we've got albedo, we've got normal, we've got height. We don't have metalness map. We don't need it really. So in here we just cut it. We don't have roughness, but we need it. And we've got ambient occlusion. So let's plug albedo to albedo normal map to normal map also we can preview this one in 3d viewport by pressing right mouse button and selecting view in 3d viewport and you can see the result in this window let's grab height it should be updated in 3d view and ambient occlusion map. Yeah, you can see it has changed. And we still have no roughness map. Roughness map can be generated from color map in here, but we need another node. Let's press spacebar and type roughness generation. Here we have roughness generation let's plug color map into here we can preview how it looks like into the to the viewport it's something like this so far and let's plug roughness into roughness slot so right now we've got complete PPR material with a lot of glitches and which doesn't tile. So what issues do we have to be solved? For sure we've got gradient coming from one side to another so that the texture is very bright on one side and dark on the other side. So to do this we have to remove that gradient so we need to bring another node which is called gradient removal. This is something what happens on the on color, so let's bring color input to gradient removal. Let, let's preview that gradient removal node into the view. And let's set its value to 1. Hopefully it's enough, and let's replug it into albedo. Yeah, you can see it looks much better. We are going to cut this part with the folded plastic ruler anyway, so I wouldn't worry about this. So, so far we've got material which still has glitches and doesn't tile. So what we have to do is we need to bring seam removal node. So we press the spacebar. Of course we can pick it from here 
if we want to, but with the space bar is much faster. So gradient oh seam removal node. And as you can see this node needs material input and can have ignore input and structure guide input. So those squares are squares for masks. This one is for material. So let's grab this material into here. And if we execute this node, it will tile entire texture, but it will tile using all that broken data too. So it means we'll have that broken data distributed across the texture somewhere. So what we have to do right now is to tell the artificial intelligence to skip this area and skip this area with the ruler. How to do this is we have to create masks. So we need to bring another node, which is called mask paint. And let's plug so far any texture which helps us to visualize what we are doing. And let's preview this one into the viewport. And let's bring more space. And what we have to do right now is to use mask and paint all those areas we want to be ignored by AI. So let's increase the size of brush. It can be increased using that slider, but it can be also increased using plus or minus button as a shortcut. So let's paint it in here. We don't not want ruler. Usually after reconstruction, data on edges is pretty glitchy because it didn't have enough data to be reconstructed. So we need to trim it a bit more. Let's increase the brush size to make it faster. Let's remove the ruler. I think that black spot should be also removed. What else? Hmm. I'm not sure about this one, but let's kill it. What else looks weird? This tank looks weird. Let's mask it as we don't want AI to reuse this area. And this tank looks weird. Let's kill it. Oh, this edge is broken. It's broken because UV wasn't super accurate well it was done in ZBrush but doesn't matter it's fixed already yeah I think that's it and let's see what AI is going to do with this so let's plug material this time into here. And plug this mask into ignore slot in sim removal. And let's press right mouse button and execute the node. And let's see what AI is going to do.
yeah i think it's done let's preview this node in 3d view so as you can see ai did pretty good job let's change tiling preview to free I'm doing it to make sure there's nothing super strong which makes this pattern visible so probably in game it would be visible from this point of view yeah I can see anything more we should fix Check the height map. I think height map is also okay. So, yeah, I think the texture is done. So, what we have to do right now is to add output node. This one helps us to export all my textures outside from Artomatics. So let's go into advanced setting and we can pick the output path. Let's call it GP Sand 2 to 3. Let's copy this name. So we've got folder selected and let's add this to the name. In here you can see the name previewed. So it's going to be called GP Sand 2 to 3 Albedo Height Map, whatever later. And I think that's it. We can just press export button and it should be done. Yeah, it's over. We've got the material. In case we want to go back into here, let's save it. Oops. Automatics file. And I think this step is over so far. Hopefully you won't have to go back. Let's close the automatics. So let's see our textures. We've got them in here. I think they're not ready yet, but let's open them in substance and create substance file to be loaded into Marmoset toolbag. So let's open the substance designer and we need to create new substance. It has to be PBR based material roughness type for us and here we have base color output, normal output, roughness output, metallic output we didn't have any metallic before but it doesn't matter and hype what is missing is ambient occlusion so let's copy this one and turn it into ambient to ambient occlusion Okay, so we've got 
six outputs right now we need to field with data so let's grab our texture and let's plug color into base color we can preview it in here let's grab our normal roughness map metallic map we don't have metallic so let's create fake metallic map because it is not metallic surface so it has to be just black pure color so let's bring uniform color in here switch it to grayscale let's change resolution because it's 4k as default let's we don't need 4k I usually set it to 16 to 16 pixels because lower resolution might cause some problems and we don't need higher one. So 16 by 16 is optimal. In here we've got light map. Let's plug it in. And ambient occlusion map. And here we have the results. Let's check the base color. I think we can try to remove some ambient occlusion shadows from the color using ambient occlusion mask. So let's do this. To do this, we need to use ambient occlusion cancellation mask note sorry so let's bring this one it reads color input and ambient occlusion so this is map before and map after yeah you can see how nice it removes all those micro shadows. So let's plug it in here. What else left? I think roughness needs to be fixed a bit more. It's definitely not a good one. It feels like it's wet surface. So it, need, it needs some work. Let's try to fix roughness map then. Mm. What do we need to work on this one? Let's use existing roughness and color map. For color, let's try high pass grayscale. Oops. Well, first, we need to convert it into grayscale. Okay, and high pass. So what we want, we want just all those dark spots to be shiny. So how to do this is to invert. So let's see how this one looks like. So we can see this one, this is the roughness. And when we turn it into color map, it's black so it means we have to invert roughness map in here because in roughness map everything what is dark is going to be shiny and everything which is white 
is going to be made. So we've got color. We need to increase contrast for sure, so let's try. Contrast. Same in here. I'm just experimenting, I don't know what's going to happen. Let's blend those two maps together. And bring it into roughness. I think it's better, but it still looks like it's a wet surface. So I think those black dots should be more separated. Let's increase contrast. Luminosity. Better, but still looks like wet. Let's try to use histogram. Scan. It should help us to limit amount of those dots. Let's plug it in here. Let's temporarily replace that color because it distracts us and let's put something uniform like 187 for all RGB channels. It should give us a gray color. Yeah, so right now we can focus on roughness a bit more. Okay, I think it's better. Let's pull it back a bit. So right now we are blending together data from the color map and from generated roughness. And we are trying to bring those black dots up, but we want them a bit less dense as they were. They have to be a bit bigger, I think, still. So with the opacity slider we are changing power of data coming from color map and data coming from roughness map. Let's blur it a bit. In high quality. Not too much. Okay, and when it's blurred, let's bring it back together with the blend node. So let's use what we had with blurred version. So let's change the opacity a bit. A 
what it looks like. So right now let's increase, I don't know, contrast probably again. I think it feels a bit like a crystals already. Yes. Doesn't feel wet. Yes, I think it should work. Let's try to get this one. Let's save this substance file in case we want to do any modifications. Let's call it tweaks. So it's going to look like this, probably. Yeah, I think it's good enough. So... Let's export. We need to export... Albedo, because we removed shadows from it. And we need to export roughness only. So let's do this. Export outputs as bitmaps. Let's leave only base color and roughness. Oh, before I proceed, I need to cancel that. Because I know the exact physical value for sand for RGB, I should compare this one, how far it is. So on the histogram you can see it's around in here. So let's bring uniform color and let's insert RGB values for Send. Okay. So this is average RGB value with the color of sand. So if we jump into here, we can see it. It almost matches perfectly. So we don't have to change anything. Let's kill it and let's go back. Export outputs. We need base color, roughness, and nothing more. Let's put it into GBSend. It doesn't matter how we name the texture because we are going to rename it anyway and let's it has to be PNG and let's export it yeah it's done let's go back to the folder yeah so we've got those initial textures let's save them as backup okay we've got backup in case we failed with something and we need to replace this one so let's copy the name and kill it and paste the name for our exported from substance and roughness so let's copy the name of this roughness and kill it and paste this name in here Okay, so we've got albedo, I mean occlusion height, 
normal and roughness you can see this one has changed because the input has changed so it's not correct anymore so it means we, you can kill everything we've got in here and simply plug what we've got directly yeah we've got it as I said we don't need 16 bits for color because it's 8 bits anyway so let's trim it down in here we have to keep 16 bits for a normal map in here it's still 8 bit it's still enough this one doesn't matter height map has to be 16 bits and ambient occlusion can be 8 bits so let's switch it and I think we are ready to generate sbar file to be previewed in toolback so let's save this substance as gb sand 223 okay and let's generate sbar file with the same name yeah, everything is okay. Okay, so it's done. We can shut down the Substance Designer right now. And this step hopefully is over. So right now we've got all textures as per file. We don't need anything in here. Let's push it into back and call it back up again in case we need it. And this is what we've got. And let's have it tested on as per file itself. So to make it, let's bring Marmoset toolbag free. I've got already prepared scene I'm using for testing. So it's a standard ball with background and I use one of my HDRI maps for testing. So let's bring the substance file in here. We can kill those. I'm just pressing delete button on, on them because we don't need them. Let's bring substance into toolbag free. We have to wait a bit, yep, we've got it. And we just need to drag and drop it to apply the material, and here it is. By default, height map is not being grid, so let's turn it on. You can see it's a mess because scale is set to high. Let's make it a bit lower. Let's change the amount of triangles. Okay, let's try to play with gloss a bit, maybe now. Let's play with the height up on parallax. Yeah, I think it's okay. It tiles pretty nice. We can check how it tiles by pushing this one. Yeah, feels okay for me. I think the texture is done already. Yeah, it looks like that's it. I can try to play with other lighting settings, so let's kill this light. 
by pressing right mouse button. Move it across the sky if we want to. Bring some from the bottom. Yeah, but these are just tweaks to get nice render. You can change the tiling. Yeah, hope you like it. Thanks. Bye.